So this is the spotlight event. Evening, yeah? How are you guys doing? Excited? Nice, nice, nice. So my name is Derek, Derek Mugabe, and I work with Startup Africa as a project manager. Um, I, th I think I love hosting people from the media because I also have a media background. Uh, but uh, for today, I'm just going to be a very humble moderator to help, you know, drive this conversation. One thing I know about Solomon is that he hosts a very um, tough show called The Hard Questions, yeah? And today he's the one on the spotlight. And we're asking him the hard questions on how he made that transition from uh, uh, being an employee, an amazing one at that, and then, you know, starting a very uh, fast-growing organization, which is such a big thing, you know, if you've been able to hack that, that means, uh, you know, people should really listen to your story. And that is uh, primarily the reason that's why we're having Solomon here. But I won't give his CV because he's the best person to give it. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let's welcome Solomon, yeah? And after that, uh, usually people, when they're introducing themselves, they want to identify with their jobs, yeah? We start by saying, I'm a project manager and stuff like that. But I want us to do it differently with you. Who is Solomon apart from the work that you do? Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Good evening. How are you? Great to see some ladies in the room. Ah, I think it's 80 on 20. Looks like the room has so many uh, female entrepreneurs. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's really such a joy and honor to come and share my story. And I'm going to be as open as I can with you. So I hope this is a safe space for us to share. Um, Solomon, uh, how can I say? Okay, um, I'm a father and a husband. I'm a father of four children. I am a husband to my wife called Vivian Serwanja. Um, who I've been with for the last 15 years, which is good. Wow, yeah. <laughs> I am an investigative journalist, um, and I lead the team at the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. I did 15 years of my life in journalism. I worked for different uh, stations, started my career really out with the Daily Monitor, moved to UBC, moved to NTV, moved to NBS, moved to KTN in Nairobi, moved to the BBC, came back to NBS, and then I felt like, what more is there? I also did some uh, freelancing for TRT News in Turkey, and I said, you know what, I think it's, I need to move, I need to start something. Uh, right now, I am also a PhD student. My PhD is in journalism um, at Uganda Christian University. And in 2026, the next time I'll be here, maybe I'll be Dr. Serwanza. Yeah, but um, yeah, so that's pretty much who I am. And I love storytelling. I love, everyone of us loves to be listened to. Um, and on the flip side, very few people want to listen. Hmm? Do I make sense? Yeah. So I want to be that listening person who listen, listens closely to people's stories and then use this clout to amplify their stories. And so for me, journalism has pretty much been a passion, a passion that I have carried with for the last 15 years. Even right now, as I'm into these managerial positions of being a CEO and team leading and doing a lot of um, admin and oversight, I take off my jacket and I go back and do journalism. Um, and I remove this ED stuff and just go back and go to the field and tell stories. So every year I've promised myself that I will do one big investigation. I think my big investigation last year was the ghosts of Untungamu. I don't know if any of you watched that investigation. This year I'm concluding on an investigation called Zoka. So beyond just doing my, my you know, CEO role of resource mobilization, of writing grants and meeting partners and supporting on report writing and all these things, I am a journalist because that's what I'm passionate about. 
And I think at the very core of all of us entrepreneurs is passion. I think the first thing that we need to do is being passionate about what we do. Before you can break in, break out to start anything, you have to be passionate about it. Because I can tell you, money may not be the immediate reward. It's that passion that you wake up to every single morning to do even when you're not paid. So for all entrepreneurs who want to start out or break out, I, would, I really want you to think of what are you passionate about. What is that thing that you're passionate about? If you're into accounting, do you do accounting as a job or you do it as a passion? If you're into IT and coding, if you're into photography and videography, are you just paid as a cameraman because you have to work or is it a passion for you to actually do photography? That you will wake up in the morning, get your Kalito money, jump on a border and go and do street photography where no one is paying you. But because you're so passionate about photography and you do these amazing pictures of, you know, street life in Kampala and just put them online. So I think at the bottom line of every entrepreneur, and I'll speak in, in detail about this, are you passionate about what you want to do? Because I'll tell you, the journey is moving from employment where you're guaranteed of a salary at the end of every month and being able to break out and start out it is tough it is very tough I left a job that was paying me at the time I think I was one of the highest paid news anchors I was earning 7 million shillings a month I just said you know what I think I'm done and Leaving a job that gives you 7 million shillings a month is not easy. It's really difficult <laughs> to say, I am leaving, um, but I am leaving to do something I am passionate about. So maybe I'll speak to that later. Sorry, I, Derek, I went, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's who I am. Thank you so much. I think um, in Luganda they said to see him today, yeah? The conversation has started. And thank you so much, Solomon, for that uh, very, uh, you know, a very rich introduction but then um what happens to many of us if we employed we get to uh, that place of comfort yeah so i want us to also understand from your story what were those um moments where you really felt that being employed at maybe uh bbc or being employed at nbs is such a beautiful thing were there moments in your journey that really um made you feel so comfortable made you feel uh you know you love your job and all that you wouldn't want to leave because people may think that probably it was toxic that's why i ran away but want to understand where there are those beautiful moments and if they were there can you highlight some of them so i just want to tell you derek television is fame i mean who doesn't want to be famous you know what i mean like you move on the street and everyone hi solomon hi you sign autographs get a cup of coffee for free move into cafe javas and mandela comes and says mm, don't worry i'm gonna pay for your dinner or your lunch Television is such a beautiful job, you know, having to be in people's sitting rooms every day, you know, and having to put on those suits and, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it's fame, it's, you're up there, you know what I mean? Like, everyone wants to associate with you, um, you know, even your fellow staff that you're with in the newsroom, you know, you're a star. But it also sometimes blinds you beyond, like it blinds you to see beyond the four walls of the newsroom. All you think is about news, news, news every day, news. You wake up at 8, come to the newsroom, and you leave at 10. Television is shrewd. The story that you guys see for two minutes, it takes us the whole day to do. A whole day to do. You wake up in the morning to do a two-minute story, you know. And so for me, we, I, I, was, I was reduced to news. You know what I mean? Like, and that's how the system shapes you. The way the newsroom system shapes you. 
it confines you there. So you come into the newsroom, newsroom meeting, come with ideas, read, you get a call, there's an accident here, you run. You don't think anything else but news. And so you don't get to open your mind to, you know, to listen to what other people are doing. You just focus on news. How do I break the news? How do we be the people to break the news? How do we deliver this bulletin? How do we, like, everything is there, right? You're just thinking of accounts. For some of you are in accounts. You wake up, open the spreadsheets, do Excel, then in the evening get your bag and go home. You don't think of anything else. And I'm really excited about what Startup is doing because then you get people, you expose them to think beyond their four walls of accounts, of journalism, of, you know, that, that there's life. But going back to that, for me, you know, being on television and prime news bulletins and, you know, it, it, it's, it was a, it's, a, it's a pride. I was born for this. I remember the night I said, I anchored my last bulletin. And I said, thank you very much for being with me for the last 15 years of my life on television. But today the curtains are coming down, the cameras are getting off, and the lights are going off. And it was, it was such an emotional day that day. You know, they brought me a cake. And I, and, but I remember going to my car in the parking, and I cried. Like, I cried. Like, I was wailing. I closed myself in the car, put all you know, the, the, the windscreens up and everything. And I was crying. And part of me was like, have you, have you really made the right decision? Like, all I knew was cameras, light action. That's all I knew. Because I, I grew up on television. I grew up in the newsroom. All I knew was news. All I knew was coming into the studios. And all I knew was makeup. All I knew was glamour, fame. You know, who wants to lose that? You know, who wants to lose that? And the way the fame industry is, like if you get away from people's eyes, they forget you. <laughs> and, you know, you're worried about all that. Who is going to know Solomon Seranja tomorrow? Like, give it two years and people will just not even talk about you. In fact, I was surprised with the latest um, numbers, statistics. I don't know if you guys saw the report. I was still ranked as one of the top three, you know. And I'm like, mm, I'm not even on TV. So people still even remember me. But somewhat, it, it, was, it was a joy working on television. I was so comfortable in that space. I was, I was so comfortable. And I was one of the most paid journalists. Like, I mean, who dropped seven million shillings a month? You know what I mean? Yeah. Plus other gigs of, you know, you have to moderate, MC. And, you know, because that comes with the fame, mm? you know, the World Bank calls you. We are launching the World Economic Report. Before you know it, you are the, you know, World Economic Forum and you're traveling the world, you know. They call you to, every brand wants to associate with you because of who you are. And so when you get into that space of like, am I really doing the right thing? <laughs> Going into something I have never, you know, I have never thought about. And I'm walking away from what I knew. And I remember calling my wife that night and saying, uh, when I, I, you know, I just called and I just cried. And she said, it's okay, you can't cry. <laughs> she just was there and I was not saying anything. I was just crying. I was just crying. And I called my best friend. I'm like, Moses, have I done the right thing? He said, the first question is like, where are you? <laughs> And I told him I'm in the car parking. It was painful. So for all entrepreneurs, that courage to drop something and take on, get into the world of unknown is what differentiates us from everyone else. Like that, that decision to go into the unknown is very important for every entrepreneur. Like... You've got to take that risk. I don't know where I was going, but I just had to go. Like, and, and you know, you can't say I calculated the... I mean, yes, in business, we calculate risks and everything. But I just want to go. I don't know where I'm going. So I have that thing in me of 
when it's time up, I jump. I remember when I was leaving NTV, um, I just, you know, walked to Agi Kondi at that time and said, Agi, I want to go. Like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to NBS. That little station, it's going to close tomorrow. How can you leave the mighty NTV? I said, no, I don't think. Yeah, I just want to go. So I left, you know. And when I was, and I did my years at NBS, and I woke up, and I wrote a resignation letter. Please note, I don't know where I'm going. I am leaving a job. I'm leaving fame. I'm leaving everything. I wrote that letter. It was three sentences. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. Two, I am serving my notice of three months. And I need your blessing. I wrote that letter. I sent it to the HR office. I copied my boss, Kin Carissa. And I remember that time, it was Friday, Kin called me. Because it was like, you man, I'm in a mosque. My, my, my assistant has called, Solo, what is this? He said, no, 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 Solo, let's talk. So <laughs> I went and we had a conversation and said, sir, allow me leave. I, I don't want to leave on a bad note. I want to leave on a good note. I want your blessing, sir. I want you to be proud of me that you mentored the CEO. Right? That I want you to be part of my journey. I don't want to go because, you know, and yeah, because anyway, you can't burn bridges. Right? This is why I'm able to come back on TV. You know, the other day I was calling me and told me, Solo, why don't you come back and do your big show, Elections 360, uh, towards elections. Ah, I said, sir, you want me back on TV? <laughs> you know, so, but there are still those open opportunities. That's the second lesson. Where you're living, please do not burn bridges. Because anyway, it's your market. They could be your next clients. They could be your next contact. They could be that reference that is needed. So you cannot burn bridges. Sometimes I see people who have left media houses and they are writing like long, they're exposing media houses, they are writing all these things. And I'm thinking, okay, this market of journalism is cartoon. And these are mighty men who know men, who know women, who actually make decisions. So it's a small world. As entrepreneurs, never burn bridges. You just absolutely can't. So I, I, I woke up and I told my boss, Kin, I need to leave. Please bless me. And he said, you know what, Solo? Leave, but whenever I call you, you should come back. And I said, Sir, I mean, if you call me and you still want me to be on TV, I will come. So, of course, then the producer of the morning show calls me for the media roundtable, this time as a panelist and not a host, because I used to host it, and this time, you know, I'm this side. And... Yeah, and when I left, I told my wife, rent is on you, food is on you, hospital bills are on you, everything is on you. And so, that's another thing about entrepreneurship. You need to have a backup system. You need to have a strong partner who believes in the vision with you, who is able to carry you through. You can't do it alone. Imagine... Your wife doesn't like give you green lights or your boyfriend or your fiance and you're in it alone. You still have to provide for the family. You know what I mean? So the end of the day, man, passion doesn't put food on the table. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to pay rent. So I think one of the most important thing to me at that time was my wife saying, I'm ready to walk this journey with you. I'm ready to support you. I'm ready to be in the gap. So I told her, for the next season of about three years, I don't know what the future holds, but you're going to be in charge. So there's always, it may not be even your spouse, but it may be your support system. So you need a support system as an, inter, an entrepreneur that is going to carry you through. And because you're, going, you're, you're starting, right? The other thing, when, you know, when I decided to, to leave, I started sharing my story with someone, people. Everywhere I would go, I, I would say, hey, by the way, so I'm starting this thing. 
you know whether you know because at that time the fame the lights were still on me you know they went you know closing out slowly but before they would almost get out i would like you know have dinners with ambassadors have you know they are calling you for all these things and i'll share i want to do this 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 so i i kept sharing i kept throwing the word out there i kept you know i kept talking about this i want to do something i want to mentor the next investigative journalist i want to train people i want to start this center of excellence in africa that is about investigative journalism uh, everywhere i would go out talk about investigative journalism so the word started going around you know investigative journalism the african institute for investigative journalism rough idea some people would say african center for investigative journalism the others are saying a j i j i they were not, like at least but people knew an idea they had an idea of what i was actually trying to do i should be surprised of so after i left work i went home and i started scribbling things and so this is how aij was born so I started to scribble, you know, scribble things. Pff, Africa, what do I want? I don't want to just be Uganda. I want this thing to be a continent. I want to, you know, inspire the next investigative journalist across Africa. I started to write down these things. What's my purpose? What's my objectives? What is it that I want? I started scribbling the dream down, you know. Like I started writing it down. What do I envision? You know, I want to get connect Africa together. You know, investigative journalists, you get John Alan Namu in Nairobi, get Anasa Nas in Ghana, get Solomon Seranja in Kampala, get, you know, so that they create a network that speaks about investigative journalism. And that, like, I started just to put those ideas down. I started writing, writing, writing. And then I got a mentor, a guy who was already in the industry running things. That's another thing, you need a mentor. Because at the time, you're just young, you just have, you just have crazy ideas. Crazy, you know. You want to, for example, do shoes out of tires. Oh, I don't know. You, I don't know what your your you, your business is. Oh, I want you want to do something, but you must because at that time you're a young person. You just have crazy ideas, and sometimes when you're passionate about, about something, our passion like takes us into overdrive. Like we we become overly ambitious and zealous, but then you need to get mentors, people who are in that space to help you shape your entrepreneurship, right? So I had to get mentors who I shared with and I said, you know, I want to do this. What do you think? I want to do this. What do you think? You know, this is what I want to do. So somewhat they helped me to funnel my, like my dream. Because it was so wide. Like, boss, that is so wide for you. Can you narrow it? You know, it kept, that idea started to form up, form up, form up, form up, form up. Meanwhile, everywhere I go, I started you know, to say, I work for the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. <laughs> you know, I, so I was trying to unbrand NBS and try to rebrand African Institute for Investigative Journalism. So, I mean, everywhere they would say, oh, you know, Solomon Seranja celebrated journalist news anchor at NBS. So when I grab the mic, I'm like, oh, thank you very much. I now currently lead the team at the African Institute, even when he wasn't there. This is a dream, just, you know. So it just, yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> you step into the unknown, my dear. <laughs> so yeah, I started to, you know, call things as though they are. Yeah, and I think that's called faith, right? Yeah. yeah. So I started to, you know, scribble things together and all that. And because I kept talking about it, one day I'm there, and the Netherlands ambassador calls. Like, hi, Solo, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. Do you want to come over and we do coffee at the embassy? Like, yes, you yes, your excellence. So, with this crude dream, I go. Like, so, last time you talked to me about this thing called the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. Um, we want to support you. Hmm? I'm like, S say again. <laughs> We want to support you. Um, we, we are shifting to a new office. But we've got an email from Amsterdam that we are going to pack all this equipment and furniture and take it back. But I want you to choose 
anything you want in this office. And I donate it to you. The rest, we'll pack them back and take them. You should have seen the smile on my face. <laughs> you know how like you want everything? I want that table. I want that. I want that. <laughs> I want this couch. I want that. I want that TV. Oh, I want that. You know, I was just like crazy. Where am I taking them? Nowhere. <laughs> so I said, then, then I said, and I want this office because I was in his office. Like, then he said, this office is yours. Take everything. So I took the couch. I took. Meanwhile, I don't even, like, I was overwhelmed. You know, the screens, the computers, the, uh, you know, they just gave me the screen, but they took their, um, yeah, hard drives and everything. But I was excited. At that time, I, because I, I wanted everything, the guy said, but you have about two days to come and pick them because we're going into the, and I'm like, my goodness, where am I going to get money to get trucks to pick these things? And where am I taking them? <laughs> so somehow I mobilized resources, packed things in there, and then I said, I called a friend who has a bigger space. I said, Chris, you can't just believe they have given us furniture and everything. Where can we put it? He said, Oh, I have a store. I'm like, Chris, you don't understand. It's too much. He said, Okay, 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 okay. Let me just get clear some space. So I got all the equipment and everything took it to Chris's home, packed them there. I'm like, ah, the dream is beginning to shape up. <laughs> so because I had, again, it comes from talking about something. So please, when you have that vision and dream, talk about it. Let it not just stay in your heart, but go crazy with it. You know, I want to start this. I want to start that. Tosigalana show. Don't stay with it internally because you don't know who your next contact is. You could talk about him like, you know, maybe when I'm talking about, I'm talking with a, a billionaire called Derek Mugabe. And I say, Derek, by the way, there is this, I got this idea. I mean, I think you can meet this person. They're, they're amazing. I think they're doing great work in that space. And somehow, you know, because I had it from you, you know. And I'm like, okay, now furniture is here. I have no office. I have nothing. I have not even registered. I have, it was just, that's, that's such a crude thing. So I got a lawyer friend. I said, you know what, Godwin? I don't have money, but I need you to help me. We register this. So I got my other friends um, as shareholders or as, yeah, company people. And then we went to URSB, registered it as a company limited by guarantee, uh, got our certificate. But for us to start operating, we needed an NGO certificate. And that is the hardest thing to receive from the NGO bureau board so we put in an application and you know because of the name so somehow you'd go and like hey Solomon what do you want how can we help you hey don't investigate us so there's that whole thing that would help open doors but when it came to the final big man hmm, hey, the man so investigative journalism mm -mm. no 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 the certificate was ready but it was not being signed. Hey, you want to create havoc, investigative journalism, what? But somehow, um, sometimes it's good to be humble. Yeah. How many of you know humility is the biggest asset? Like, it breaks walls. Like, somehow when you are humble, you, 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 you even melt iron. Humility melts iron. So I just went and went to this man and said, Mr. Kelo, it is me, Solomon said, Wanja, sir. I poured my heart out. This is where I'm coming from, sir. This is, but he said, but you're going to just be doing bad stories on government. Yeah, yeah. I said, sir, to be honest, it's part of it. <laughs> but it is good for our democracy and accountability. But you've known me for being a credible journalist, right? So I, I, I also, I had to convince the man. Eventually put pen to paper and he gave us uh, an operating license for five years. Yeah, I mean, it's a big thing. 
So we got the five years. Most of the NGO was given two years, like, right? Renewable. I got five years. I pray that they renew them because <laughs> I've done some crazy things, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the next, I think the lesson there is to formalize your business or your dream from just being an idea you start to actually formalize it, register it, right? Uh, because sometimes those doors will not open except if you formalize your business. So go and register, register it with URSB. Go and register it with maybe the, whichever, you know, I don't know if it's the business or then you get URA, you know, then you get, you register. Formality is part of, you know, business. Because if you do not formalize your business, you lose out. Because sometimes there could be a call for maybe a service provider, but because it knocks you out on technical ground, because you don't have a URSB, you have not registered your business, you have not registered for maybe URA, you have not registered for PPDA, you have not like there are those formal formality things that knock you off. And sometimes, as entrepreneurs, we need to go beyond our passion. We also need to look at what is required of me to get business. If it's to formalize your business, go and formalize it. Get a TIN number. File, even when you don't have business. File every 15th and say, you are a, I did not actually do business. So you file zero. And your A has no problem with you because you didn't get business anyway. You know? So the next time the, the, there's maybe a bid for you to supply something, it must find you with all the necessary documents. As an entrepreneur, please mark my word, formalize your business. And this is why. One year into it, the EU starts to notice the work that we're doing and, you know, the little work, the little, little things. Um, and so uh, I think our first, grant, our first grant was with the Austrian Development Agency and they gave us $10,000. But it was also a tag of war because at the time, the first question is, do you have, um, no, I think at that time we had already got, it said, give us your NGO registrations number. We had it. Give us your URSB thing. We had it. Give us your TIN number. We had it. Give us your local government certificate. These ones they give at local government. We had it. So we sort of had all these things, yeah? We submitted them because for them it's a requirement for them that whoever they are giving some, you know, donations or funding, they must meet a certain criteria. And so because we had those, it helped us to get our, you know, first grant of $10,000. When we got $10,000, we got an office space. In Chira, Bulindo, we didn't even want to come to town, to your town where it's expensive. We went to Chira, Bulindo. And the, the mind behind going to Chira is wherever gold is, people dig to find that gold. So if I have gold, you will come to me. You will come to Bulindo. Trust me, in that little office of ours in Bulindo, I've hosted ambassadors. I've, who they, oh, every big man, all the shows that you see I do, all the big mighty men and women in this country who you've seen me interview, or you've seen me meetings or what, they come to Chira Bulindo, including the American ambassador, who, of course, at the time we wanted to tape the hard questions show, they said that we go to the embassy. I said, no, you're coming to Chira. The mighty U.S. embassy came to Chira in there and we talked so because it was even cheaper you know it the space was cheaper you got big space and we're just paying some you know about three million shillings for literally an entire floor right so even when you're starting up please don't go for the expensive places because your little savings that you would have gotten will be depleted mango the business should start small like do not become overzealous and rent an entire like flow when you're just starting up for heaven's sake you know so we got that space and we paid for rent out of that money um and they were so you know it was more of um um an institutional grant which really to support the organization to come up 
you know. So we paid rent, we paid the dues and everything, but we'd turn up and come. So then, but you know, we tried to minimize the costs. And then I started selling my vision to people, the staff. I started with finance because when a donor gives you money, finance is the first thing. So I got this intern from Makere. I said, you know, come and we work. But I don't have money. <laughs> but I have a vision. So, you know, they came. I remember we, we got into this building and it didn't have SC. Ngatu tu yaniro. There's a place that is a, like you would sweat. You know? Sauna, thank you. <laughs> you would sweat. And there's that time like from about two to four. My God, when the sun is in a certain angle, no SC, you would sweat. But that person came and we started interning. And, you know, I got then a programs officer, again, an intern. And I was just sharing my vision. I said, believe me. So I, as entrepreneurs, please do not hire because you have your little savings. Hire an accountant, a big accountant. You know, I want SCCA, MBA. Boss, you're just starting up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So what I did... When we recruited these, when I got these people, I called my mentors and I said, please, I want to ask that these people get mentorship and yeah, internship at your office. So I distributed them in some of the biggest NGOs and they learned. You know, they learned how to use QuickBooks. They learned how to use all these things. They, start, they learned how to do filing and everything and, and all that. And then they came back. When they came back, they could do it. You know, and so somehow then I started to pay them, started to give them some, you know, funding and all that. And then the team grew. I'm happy to say right now I have a team of 10 people. Yeah. I have a team of 10 people who come to office every single day to think. Now, I started then to say, hey, Derek, I have not given you back the mic. Because that's... <laughs> I actually forgot I'm a moderator. I'm now listening. Yeah? <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Yeah. So I started to think, okay, um, now I have this stuff, but as, 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 as a CEO, I started then to think of how do we bring in money to the organization? Because at that time, I'm surviving off my wife's... I would ask my wife, I don't have fuel. She gives you like a hundred K. And mommy said, one just handy kidawa no. You know, like it's tough. It's tough. It over is a week um chalawa or kagwedam. Um but it it's tough, right? So um you know you know and you know you remember you're a celebrity, yeah? So you can't call everyone but never pay um to all of everything. You know, you have your that cup pride and sometimes you're like Ah, Sinana airtime. Huh? You're like you're going to meet, you know, an ambassador at Serena. Nenga boy, you know, you take a mimi to along a kuminata. What would you do now? You're just going to go and you know what I mean? Like you're meeting these big people, you have to order for coffee. Coffee, please. So sometimes I'll say, water. <laughs> uh, warm, please. Thank you. You know, not because I don't want to do coffee, but, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's crazy. The life of an entrepreneur is crazy, trust me. Like, you have to navigate all those things to reduce on your costs, but to, you know, go and pitch. You know, you have to go and pitch. So I noticed that I had to look for money to make the organization sustainable. Before we knew it, the $10,000 had elapsed. Gone. So during that time, a CEO is a big title for a salesperson. That's it. You can't be a CEO and you're not posting numbers. You, I mean, okay, boss. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've managed people very well, Bichi. 
where are the numbers? So I, I understood that as a CEO, I have to go out there and sell. And sell and meet people and sell. How many of you know that the heart of any organization is the sales department? Sales is everything. You've got to sell. You've absolutely got to sell. So when I understood that, then I learned how to write grants. What language? How do you write a grant? You know, I, I got into co-creation meetings with people. When people are writing grants, like I would go and say, okay, let's also write together. You know, the big organizations that are known and they're getting big funding, I would say, but we can implement some activities. So then we started to write on big organizations. So for example, a big organization would get like a grant of $500,000, but we have 50K in there. You know, eh? So I learned the, I, I learned the mastery of writing grants, right? So would, I would suggest activities. So I would know, mm, there's a call. But you know, this call is saying, for example, right now there's a Danida call. I don't know if any of you have seen it. There's a Danida call, but the requirements are that the organization must have $110 million. Now, that automatically gets you out. But it doesn't make you lose hope. So what then you do is you go to the big boys who have actually handled the $10 million and say, okay, can we do something? You bring up ideas. So that when the money comes, they sort of sub-grant you to do some work. So, so you, you pitch with them. But then you have to know. You have to go out there. You have to go to the market. Every morning when I wake up and put my feet on the ground like this, and after saying my prayer, I tell myself, Solomon, akatale kagudeo. People are selling, people are trading. What are you taking to the market and who are you selling it to? Every morning, the market is open every time you wake up. You may wake up at 7. They're taking a product to the market. And as, a, as an entrepreneur, then you're thinking, what am I taking to the market? What is it that I'm taking to the market? And so when I began to understand that, I was like, okay, then we have to go into product development. Because what in that product, then the, the market, there's nothing you're taking to the market, and therefore we can't buy anything. So we started to think around product development. And so what I did is I got a team of young people and I got into an innovation space and said, young people, what can we do? Think with me. You know? I would go and meet people. So, someone told me, Solo, you have a following of 320,000 people on Twitter. And you don't see an opportunity there? You have a following of over 100,000 people on TikTok. You have the numbers, you have the name, you have the fame. Use it to create a product for the organization. So I started to think, wake up. Okay, 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 say it. So I understood. So I started to create that product called Twitter Spaces. Right now, I host a Twitter space and it has over 29, 30,000 people listening in. And because of those numbers, I created that product and now I sell Twitter Spaces. Can you imagine? Like I'm paid. And the organization is paid to host Twitter Spaces, to lead conversations. Even when I'm writing a grant, I would say we will lead on discussions and conversations on democracy, on human rights, on accountability. Through this, we will engage the people. We will connect the people in power with the people who are being governed. And ours will be to provide that platform. And I budget for it as an activity. So we went into create, creating products, creating you know, product development is very important for any entrepreneur. We started a show called The Hard Questions. Right now, when I'm writing grants, I say we will do six episodes of The Hard Questions. Each episode is 10 million. That's 60 million. And it will be accountability conversations. And so, I look out for Felix Kulaije. I host him. Ask him the uncomfortable questions. Why are you killing people? 
But it's a grant. I wrote a grant and it's paid for. And that money helps me to pay people. Right? So we had to create products. We started the training and capacity building program. When I'm writing a grant, I say I'm going to train journalists from all across Africa on investigating illicit financial flaws and corruption. So we create a curriculum and then we put out a call. A donor is happy because the donor wants to be involved in accountability. So Transparency International will give you a grant. And one of the activities is to train journalists and give them subgrants to do investigations. So we had to get into product development. And how do I relate it with every entrepreneur? When you do not have a product you're taking to the market, you wake up, the market opens and closes, and you have not traded. The banks are trading in money. Now Longum Kaleerwe is trading tomatoes. There's an IT guy who is trading AI. What are you trading with? What's your currency of trade? What are you to what as an entrepreneur then you have to be crystal clear with your product. You have to create a product. Once you've created that product, then package the product. I think that is also important. That is why Nalongo Ekalewe Atunde Nyanya Kabaket Nakatunda Mutwalu. No gena mu supermarket, capital shop as oya. No gule nyanya zamu tuwa longaziri mukavera, nengaziri nyanya kumi. Because the way you package your product determines your audience or your clientele. Right? And when you understand that, then you begin to know your target market. If my target market, for me, for example, my target market is for donors who are into the space of democracy, human rights, and accountability. My target is not government. Because anyway, government, they, the other day you know they labeled me, I'm a foreign agent, money, what? You saw the big stories. But you understand your market. If your market is uptown, then think for it. What does a client of uptown want? And how do I actually... Like, how do I package my product? Right? Right? I mean, we can go to here. Katale, um, Kekamocha. There's a restaurant. I can do a cup of tea. By the way, funny, as you guys think I'm celebrity, what, what, what. I go and take chai at Mama Naseje. Nimuga Mpana Katogo. I want to get the pulse of the community. But also, I want to get the pulse of the community. But also, I want to get the pulse of the community. Are we together? Mama Nase Jem Wen Kumitan. Are we together? Mama Nase Jem Wen Kumitan. Because they have understood their target market. So even for every entrepreneur, you've got to understand your target market very well. And then you create a product that is going to fit that target market very well. When I understood that, we, every single day what keeps me awake is what new product am I taking to the market. The other day I created an investigative poetry. It's a product. We did our first episode, and it was mwah, lovely. I am now taking investigative poetry to the market. And when I go to sell it, I tell them, guys, storytelling is changing. You used of Serwanja doing an investigation for 30 minutes. I want to get poets who are going to do, I'm, well, I'm going to do the investigation, give them the information, they put it in poetry, and it's appealing to the people. I want to do stand-up words. We call it the spoken word. You have to innovate. The other day we bathed the Mazima podcast. You have to innovate, innovate, come up with a product that you're taking to the market. If you do not get a product that you take to the market, the market will open and close on you and you not do anything. 
So as entrepreneurs, as young entrepreneurs, you've got to understand product development in your different spaces. You've got to understand. It has to be clear, crystal clear. Once you've done your product development very well, then get an aggressive marketing team. And as a young entrepreneur, it is you who is the marketing person. It is you, the business development manager. It is you. The, at that time, you're the accountant. Because you're starting up. Please do not start recruiting a finance, three marketing people. When you don't have money, you just have your little savings. You've collected your little savings of about 15, 20 million. You know, no recruiting. Daniel Chodri, Bani. You see, but you live within your means and say, okay, I have 20 million shillings on this account as a startup. What can I do with it? You start selling yourself because you understand the product very well. Yourself, because you've created it, you understand it, you live it, you breathe it, you talk about it every time you go to the market. So as young entrepreneurs, product development is very important. Product packaging is very important. But most importantly, is product marketing. You've got to understand the language of the market. What are you going to do? Climate change, social justice. What are you going to do? You have to product is up as a tutunda. You cannot leave the stage without talking about climate change. Because the world is talking about climate change. And you have to know the donor world is talking about climate change. So, I will not go and not talk about at least seeing is our climate change for democracy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, no How do I marry climate change and democracy? No, no, she is out because you're into a democracy space. But you know, climate change is the in thing. You know, right now it's artificial intelligence. Everyone is talking about AI, AI, AI. Right now, I just wrote a concept yesterday on. What is the nexus of artificial intelligence and investigative journalism? And I'm looking for funding to write a paper. Because everyone is talking about AI. How can we use AI in fact checking? How do we use AI in, for example, uh, open source intelligence? How do we use AI in um, misinformation and disinformation? You start to think in my space. How can we create an AI tool that is going to look for um, maybe, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking because everyone is thinking about AI. Category, yeah, yo, or city say, but no other people are talking, other people are thinking about the, where is the world going. The world is talking about sustainability and clean energy. Where are you? In my space as an investigative journalist, I'll say, we want to investigate. investigation now, We want to investigate sustainability of these corporate companies that are doing this and this. You have to think fast because you've gone for dinner, but you know a guy. You saw a guy who was talking on the pulpit. He's talking about sustainability, carbon trading. You're in the auditorium. You're listening. After that, you're like, ah, me. I'm in the democracy space. That, that thing of climate change and carbon trade. <laughs> As a guy is talking in front there, your head must be running and thinking, what am I selling to this guy? The guy is there talking, talking, talking. We have, you know, at the COP 2023, the world discussed that Africa should get this money. Carbon trading. Remember, the carbon trading discussion is sponsored by Stan Big Bank. When you get into the room, you think as an entrepreneur, you think beyond just coming to listen. Your thinking is Chichen's Jawano. What idea is Bastia? What is the topic that is being discussed? Who are the big people? Who has the money? As an entrepreneur, that should be in your head. Not to just listen and listen to guys talking about carbon trade. After that, you go for cocktail. No liabu sumbu, sao chicken, no ingidem motokano deka. 
If Stan Big Bank is now talking about carbon credit, chiche nyizo batunza. Afazali kambatunze Twitter space ya million ton. As an entrepreneur, you have to think. Your head has to think at a terrific speed. Or ingira mu room, no gamoki. No suka no isama suka. Walinda wa B O U governor. Wanunda ba o Julius Mukunda C S bag. Olinda ba o Derek Mugabe of Start Hub. Olinda ba Abbas Impindi of Media Challenge. Okay. Then you get a sense of who is in the room. And then you're like, okay, what are these guys talking about? Okay. What can I sell them? I know at that time you cannot do a good sale, but just whisper and say, oh, by the way, uh, Derek, I was thinking that we could actually have a conversation around the aspect of sustainability. It has really come out very strongly, but does the public understand it? Can we do coffee next week? I need an appointment. Save my number. I make sure you save my number in your phone. Ngasina kuvaku. Abantu apa banene ngaba zibu. Oba wakadi ne bazisula. Hey. No tani ko kuba basimu. Ngate wali. But when someone saves your number in their phone, you will call and it will show Solomon Serwanja calling. They're like, hey, by the way, Solo, okay, uh, let me send him a message. I'm in a meeting, but let me call you back. Those are things which are important because you have to be aggressive in the market. You have to be versatile, aggressive, you don't just go for a conference to attend a conference. Nedda. I went for the Global Media Forum, and as you know, as they invited me, it was in Bonn, Germany. It's actually happening again. Um, and I was invited as a speaker. So I reach there and I see all these guys. You know, the world, the media world assembles there. And, you know, it's just like the World Economic Forum and all that. So I'm there speaking, and you know. After that, you know, these people are coming, everyone like, hey, that was a good discussion. Uh, but I, I saw the DW general manager. Ah! Like, oh, your guy, oh. So I went to him. Of course, he was guarded, but the beauty was, like, we were taken, we had dinner. Of course, everyone else was having, but they took us to, you know, the big boys' lounge where you're having dinner and all that. So I'm like, ah, Solomon. So I said, oh, how are you? That was a good presentation. I'm like, oh, thank you. What are you doing tomorrow? He's like, um, I'm going to be on a yacht. And uh, just, yeah, but I'm like, can we talk? I'm like, yeah, tomorrow, come, come. Uh, then he calls the PA. Make sure I see this guy tomorrow, okay? Now, why don't we go on a yacht? You know, these boats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where I'm seated there, the guy, you know, the top CEO of DW. Champagne, like two people, no one else. <laughs> and we are talking, like, oh, what's going on in Africa? Yeah, I'm like, artificial intelligence, sir. <laughs> <laughs> artificial intelligence is the in thing. What can we do with DW? Name Tunda. I sold. After that, the GM called me. Ah, we got a call from the CEO. That, hey. DW is going to be partnering with the Institute on Artificial Intelligence very soon. Because when I come, when you come into the room, please do not just be reduced to a listener. What is it that you can, because that person is benefiting from you coming. Every entrepreneur must have that. Ndi wano na for example, ndi wano na enda ba startup. Kati ndo oza, startup bumba, nba jie coach. Chichi. Eh? Can we talk about the innovation and technology? Maybe the future of artificial intelligence in, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Then you say, Derek, you know, 
Why don't you look for two million? And we talk about AI. Hmm? For example, when I'm into the banking, I'm meeting these guys these days, the bankers. It's a fintech. Can we talk about fintech? Or what's the you know digital security for in the banking sector? I I mfuna oche kuba. What did he? What did he I'm sorry, I'm using Uganda. Okay, maybe I should keep it English, but yeah. Okay, so I'm just saying that as an entrepreneur, you cannot be comfortable to just come and sit down to listen for a conference. Hey, good, good, good points, good points. You know? I, I was, you know, I've been invited to attend um, the, st the, the budget reading. But really, I'm thinking, eh, okay, then idea, an, idea, an idea dropped in my mind because every time I've been covering the budget before, I see the short videos that they put, you know, the pictures and all that. I'm thinking, who is this guy who does this thing? Can't I actually, you know, can't I squeeze myself there? And I say, okay, how do, who, who controls the deal? This deal of, you know, shooting roads, you know, industrialization, mm -hmm. you know, chichi. I'm not just going to go and sit and listen to me, you know, Matia Kasaija reading a speech of three hours. Of course you scan in the room, you're like, okay. Section, you have a business, mene iri, nenge desudiru wali, nenge doli wali, nenge doli wali. And you map them out and like, siva wanunga, sifunye appointment. The life of an entrepreneur is an endless struggle to make sure that the company survives. When I used to be an employee, you know, when I finished my master's, I went to my boss and said, Katimunyongi the saint, I finished my master's. You know, now that I am employing people, every day I think for these 10 people who I have to pay a salary every single month, who have families, who have children that have to go to school, I cannot give them an excuse in seeing a saint. Absolutely cannot let them down. And that is the life of an entrepreneur. So if you're not aggressive to hunt for the next business, you will start saying, Bagai, Auntie Mulaba, Tetuina Saint. Go home. I'll call you when you come back, when I get the next business. You know? So you need to think ahead, okay, I have a grant, it's $300,000, it is two years, but what happens if it gets over? Because you're the, you're the dream bearer, you are the entrepreneur, that baby has to survive against all odds. So if you do not think for it, no gamba would join to Ndenyanya, they look and call it tomato paste. No color value addition. <laughs> what are you doing? What, what, what is that, that other thing that you... Guys, every single day when I step into the office and I close myself into that office, that little office of mine, I'm thinking, okay. Unfortunately, that burden is on you as a CEO. Everyone looks for your direction. Everyone looks, it is you a leader. Sometimes I bang tables and I tell everyone, guys, the burden of selling is on me alone. No, you've got to do something about it. I have gone to pitch, they want a proposal, sit your ass down and give me a draft. Finance, can you come with a budget? Everyone has to be part of the hunting process. Because when we kill, we eat together. You will not be there and wait for people to hunt. No. And there are people in companies like that. Not just enough na earphones put in, then he watches a movie, watches a movie, goes to TikTok, Instagram. Do you know what I go through to look for money to pay you? And you just come to watch TikTok? and post on Instagram? Really? And you know it hurts when you're an entrepreneur. Like, before when you're a staff, you know, 
you know, I'm sh- your staff. You know, just, I'm, I'm expecting my salary every month. <laughs> my friend, when you become an entrepreneur and you walk into the room, bagay never turn cock walking in at 10, 9. And you are there at six. You've done your first morning drill. I'm like, name me. Hey, do you know where I get you? <laughs> anyway, I don't know if I'm making sense. How many, how many think I'm making sense? Thank you. Thank you. It's encouraging to know that I'm making sense. So, as an entrepreneur, then you have to have a vision of where do you want your business to go into. What is your five-year plan? You have to come up with a master plan. You have to break that master plan into annual plans. In year one, my target is this. Reduce that master plan from one year to months. In the first quarter, my target is this. In the first month of the first quarter, my target is this. In the first week of the first month, my target is this. And it has to be clear, and your team must know it. Because all how the years go by, you're like, what have I done? Like, has, like, have I increased on the numbers? Have I written... How many projects have I written? How many have I implemented? How many clients have I seen? Nay, because you do not have a master plan. You don't have a guiding document that you wake up to every day. That is supposed to tell you, boss, you said that in the first week you will do this. So it's very, very important for all of us to really think hard about how do we envision our startups or our businesses to be over the next five years. For example, as an institute, over the next five years, we want to build a home. And we have a big dream of having a big campus with big offices, with accommodation, with a big dining hall, with you know, studios, with, I want to host the next big investigative journalism conference globally. Here, we have a vision of, yeah, and that vision is clear. We have a vision of putting that campus on 10 acres. We're already looking for land. I'm looking for 10 acres to put that vision on. And it's very clear that in the first year, I am buying land. So you make some savings of this, you make some savings of this, you get land and say every, every acre is actually 10 million. I am buying land. Of 100 million, 10 acres. Good, correct. The next time I'm going before a donor, I know many donors do not want to support people to build, but I'll tell them what happens if the money you've given me to do projects ends. Like, do you want me to go home when I have no rent to pay? So, as part of my project, if you're giving me $300,000, I, I am asking that you put $50,000 on the construction project. And before you know it, we'll have a big campus. But because I am deliberate about it, I have a vision. I have a vision. You know, two months ago we called an architect and we told them we visualized what we want. So I told this guy, put that into a 3D. We print it, we put it, make it our desktop servers, we make it, like, we put it everywhere. We walk in office and look at it. Oh, by the way, the institute, the motto of the institute is home of investigative journalism. So, every morning when we wake up, we want to see, mm, this is how the home of investigative journalism is going to look like. And we wake up to it every day. And it inspires us every day. And wake up the guy, guy, but guy, we have. And my dream is, once that home is bathed, I'll be happy. Like, we'll be happy that we achieved. Also, as an, an entrepreneur, the last one for me, and I hand over to you, sir. You have to know your timing. As a boss, I told the institute, 
in the next seven years, I am handing over the organization to someone else. And I'll just remain on the board. And that means setting up systems that work to keep the baby alive. Very many people who begin organizations get this sense of entitlement of the organizations. And sometimes it becomes detrimental to the success of the companies and organizations. So you have to know. Once the business picks up and you think you've done your job, sometimes your energies are running low and the company needs new, men, new, new people, new energies, new... Please hand over. And properly without grumbling. Oh, it's me. I started it. Waliyonga and itandika. Ah, okay. So sometimes, as entrepreneurs, we want to die with our organizations and companies. I started it. It is mine. Who are you to tell me? Gwengani. Finance comes and tells you, Mkama wange. I said, put 10 million shillings on my account. You want me to repeat that again? Zizo, is it? Is it? Come on, it's against our financial policy. It's, uh, policy, I'm policy. <laughs> <laughs> I am policy. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> so, and that's the problem. So as an entrepreneur, when you grow the, the business or the organization and you feel it has grown enough, hand over. Hand over. Let the board sit and say the founding member or the founding fathers of this company will receive maybe, you know, this man. Okay, we will pay uh, a salary worth that of an, a current ED to him. He will get medical insurance. He will get, you know, those benefits. Put it into the policy. Let the board pass those policies to help you transition but hand over the organization to someone else who will bring in new energy, but you will remain on the board to oversee. Okay? Please make sure that you know your timing. And every day, you, every day I wake up and I say one day off my time here. And I keep telling these guys, I started this company, but I have to leave it. And I've given myself timelines and deadlines and targets I'm telling you, after building that home, I will say bye. Because if I don't, tomorrow if I die, AIJ will die with me, which is not what I want. I want AIJ to survive beyond Serwanja. In fact, when I resign and I leave my job as ED or CEO, I want to leave and continue to be a Serwanja without AIJ, and AIJ will be AIJ and stand on its own. And I'll come and uh, be there and say, hello, hello. Get into my Mercedes and go home. <laughs> yeah. Like, honestly, because sometimes organizations need new minds. They need new energies. They need... All of us need to make sure that we have our timing. Last one. When your organization grows, it is important for you to set up systems that even trim your power and good. And you must be able to be flexible to allow to be managed by the system and not fight it. CEOs, especially CEOs who, are be who begin organizations and they grow. Okay, I'm going to come to you. CEOs that begin organizations and they grow usually have too much power. Gaya ingida nangama kugobi, fluma. Oba, nagamba, finance, take a million kumi kwa account ya nkati. Mkama wangi, mkama wangi, kugobi, again. Because there are no systems and structures in place. But if systems are there for you to put money on, the, on anyone's account, it has to go through finance. There are two approvers. There is this. 
nti no bango liyalo utanga to ina mafuta you will not walk to accounts and say me sina mafuta no kama kamfneo ka salary loan on my salary ba mpeyo loan ya mitwala 5 you will cut it off my salary so you have to set up financial systems like power systems that are supposed to check you the board should be able to say mkama wang ole we are firing you and you don't have any powers to say oh mo since they are appointing anga board board members you who are you who are you you're sucking do you even know where i got this organization from mwalio so as entrepreneurs, when the business grows, you need to let systems come in and subject yourself to the authority of the system. And please do not fight the system. It's part of governance, and that has to be part of the story for the organization to grow or for your company to grow. Over to you, sir. Um, one of the uh, key lessons here is that um, it, it is very hard to moderate a session with a person who moderates sessions, yeah? Uh, most likely. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think um, another product that we should think about as AIJ is uh, you doing master classes, yeah? I think uh, I've been part of uh, a corporate governance class. People were uh, paying a lot of money. And exactly what you've been teaching is what they were teaching in that class. Uh, recently, Vusi came into the country what you've been talking about is what he was talking about, and he was paid a lot of money. And I think uh, AI just should think about that product, yeah? I could be the product developer, some little money, yeah? <laughs> it's actually interesting because there's so many people want to know about investigative journalism. And when you're speaking about that, maybe I may not even be talking about masterclass for entrepreneurs, but I may be just doing a masterclass of investigative journalism, yep. right from the basics you know, what is investigative journalism, tenets of investigative journalism, interviewing as a skill. Like you just do different master classes on different sub-themes under what, what I'm passionate about, which is investigative journalism. And people can be able to, you know, come in. But thank you. I think that's a, a product which is born. Tomorrow if you see. <laughs> thank okay. you. And I'm going to work with him so that we can create it. That's a great idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but I think we, we've consumed a lot and it is important uh, for us to have a commercial break, yeah? Uh, but the commercial break will be more of uh, talking about, again, uh, this event. It happens every first Friday of the month. And uh, we have very many amazing conversations like this. Um, the, di the only difference today has been that usually I speak a lot, but today, you know, Solomon had the energy. Yeah? So today has been uh, very uh, amazing. So I want to go back to the foundation. Yeah, we've moved uh, to how AIG has been running and how I've been doing it. But I want to go back to uh, when you built the thick skin that allows you to go into the unknown. Uh, when I listened to your career, you moved from different stations, implying you were never scared to enter into new places. Maybe at the beginning you were, but you built that resilience of the thick skin, which is something many entrepreneurs do not have, the risk. Especially when we're this side uh, of employment, you find people are uh, very happy that they were working for the same organization for 35 years. And like, you guy, what did you learn working 35 years for one organization? And I think even when they become entrepreneurs, they're so scared of taking risk. But you start from the time you are uh, employed, you transition uh, from all these TVs to the time you decide to make uh, to start an organization or to become an entrepreneur. Yes, it was hard as you've talked about it, but I feel like you had the thick skin initially. And um, I want us to talk uh, roughly about it. Uh, what does this mean to you as an entrepreneur, your background of uh, being able to transition, your background of uh, being able to jump on two new things? How does it then fit into your entrepreneurship journey? Thank you. Firstly, sometimes when you feel you're bored, of what you do, you wake up every day to open financial Excel forms and sheets and play around, fit in the data. Like when you get tired of what you're doing and feel bored, it's time for you to move on. Get into other challenges. I mean, for example, I love to be challenged. I love to be challenged. I love to, I want to try something new. You know, that's what I'm saying. Every other time I'm thinking, what is the better way of doing journalism? You know, because I've done the documentaries you've seen, I've done the interviews, I've anchored news, I've asked people questions. What more can I do? You know, Kati, sometimes 
you've got to start to think of yourself, okay, I've been using quick. How many people are in the finance world here? Accounts, finance, yeah. I've been using QuickBooks. I know everything. Why don't I start on something else? Why don't I, you know, start something else? Like, so that you don't get bored. But also, too, please, please listen to this. It's very important. When you feel it's time to jump, jump. Because when that opportunity passes, you buy. It's gone. That's me. When I feel it's time to go, you can't stop me. If I feel it's time to jump, I jump. <coughs> like, I mean, um, when I was living in TV, everyone's like, hey, Gwei, eh, why are you living in TV? I said, I just want to go. Like, I'm jumping. When you master your timing, that's why the Bible says that in fullness of time, there's that, you know, everything happens, right? In the fullness of time. When that fullness of time comes and you feel that conviction, I've been convincing my friend Hatma for a long time. Hatma, you have, you know, you have a restaurant, you know, you have your things you're doing. I left. But every time you tell me, so how did you do it? And says, Atma just went. I told her, Atma. But when the fullness of time comes for you, you will leave. You know, she woke up and says, so I'm going. I'm like, there. It's time for you to go. Go. So she resigned. I'm sure you saw she resigned. And so every day she talks about my life out of, out of, you know, former employment, my life out of TV, my life. You know, she has a series she puts on Twitter and all across her platforms. But right now she's in, she's looking into her business of you know waking up every day to you know to go and shop she has a restaurant you know and to improve her restaurant maybe look at new clientele or all these things what, what there's a time where you feel like I feel like I don't I'm not doing anything here so it, me that's why I'm even telling you. I'm sure in the next seven years, Sina Chenjakolaku Institute. I need to go. Maybe I leave the institute and uh, start something different. Or I don't know, man. You know? So there's always that timing. Please master the, t the art of timing. <coughs> and when that opportunity comes and you lose it, you will take another 10 years. Until when that opportunity comes back. It, it, all of us have that. I don't know if you do, yeah? Yeah, that gut thing of there's nothing I'm doing here. Let me go. When that comes, please go. That's me. I don't know if I have bad advice, but yeah. Um, and then too, maybe the, the other thing is Know that you were you a giant in your space. Guys, I walk into the room and I am Solomon Serwanja. With or without NTV. With or without NBS. With or without the BBC. My name is Solomon Serwanja. Can we talk? There's that. When you build a brand that can stand independent of your workplace then you can face the world. In your different spaces, whether you are in accounting, whether you are in photography, whether you are in videography, I've done investigations with this cameraman called Godfrey Badebi. He's a big guy, camera, he's a big, big name in the camera world. Sometimes, the guy tells me, sorry, Solo, I have two projects I'm working on. And I wait. I wait. I say, Kali, I'll wait. Because he has mastered his craft. So all of you entrepreneurs, before you venture out, master your craft and establish yourself as a force to reckon with, with or without the company that you're working with. You have a catering farm. You have a catering farm. 
Nga wota ba deo ba fumbu mchiri ni wabila wa kabula mm. Halima tali wo. Nga gweke nyin gweka. You're like name one. Omkazo no mufumbiro mchiri ni mkwale la sendi. Wachista ni kakufumba mchiri. Wota ni kufumbu mchiri. Nuga, eh, hey, by the way, mami seru wanja mno mfumbo mchere na li mfumbira kutuke, wafoke. Eh, hey, wafu ufumba kache, eh, kanzi jendi yeku. You will start up because you are a master in your field. Irrespective of the place of work that you're working with. So what do I mean? I mean, take time to master your craft. But also to take time to create a brand. Let me say that again. Take time to create a brand to be the master in your field. It's very important. There are so many reporters out there, so many news anchors out there. Why do you call me? Or why do why why is you know why why do they call me to speak at international conferences or what what what? You've spent some time in your craft. You're the best at it. Convince yourself you're the best at it. And if you're not, then what can you do better to be the best at it? In banking, you need this guy. In project management, you need this guy. In photography, this guy will give you what you want. So what is it? What is your tool of trade? Master it, because when you master it, you get the thick skin to say, Nchitadde, atenze seru wanja sija kufa. You know what I mean? I am the best in accounting and auditing. I'll start a, an audit firm. They will call me as a consultant. I will apply if there is a call for consultancy. I will sit and put my CV in and I will compete for that consultancy. Until when you come into the room, like that's Dorothy. She used to work with Deloitte or with, you know, Ernst and Young or PricewaterhouseCoopers. She was, that, that lady used to be the top top, top auditor. Because of that, you carry a big CV in your space. You guys know that we are loyal to our babas, eh? You know, eh? So even a baba, I'll give you a short story. I used to cut my hair from hair by Ziwa, by this baba guy. This baba guy woke up and resigned. And he started the car... He got a gulayoka machine, you know, and a few things. And then he rented part of uh, a shop, na gulayoka mirror, na tekao. Guys, I go and he cuts my hair because it's skinny. Yamanye mviri zangi. Do you get the point? That's skinny. Nti ni wao ya vayo, waloba client ya wali loyal to him. So, Sal, let me answer your question. How do you grow a thick skin to actually make that decision? You've, you've just started to do accounting. You're introdu they are just introducing you to QuickBooks, Omani Excel, Tomani Zili Software Zindala, but you want to resign. I did 12 years in the industry for me to resign because I had built a CV, I had built a name, I had built an expertise that no one doesn't have. And that's investigative journalism. I grew in it, I researched it, I, re I did everything I could to grow that craft and then I jumped. I went back and studied. By the way, that's another thing I need to mention. As entrepreneurs, you have to study. I went back, I did a postgraduate degree in investigative journalism. 
I went back and did a master's in journalism and communications. Right now, I'm doing a PhD. You think I'll be the same on the same scale with you as a bachelor's? I'll put my PhD on paper. I'll put my 15 years of experience on paper. And we are competing for the same work. Call for consultancies. So personal improvement is very important. Personal improvement is very important. Passion alone is not enough for entrepreneurs. Personal improvement and mastering your craft is equally important. Yes, sir. Interesting. Um, so we are going to have a session where we're going to have questions from you guys. I, I, I feel we have very many burning questions. Is that right? We do? Uh, how many of us have questions so that we know how many we're going to take? Ah, okay, not very many. Um, so we are going to have a session uh, for questions. But um, before we jump into that, another thing that I do understand from your journey, and you could again highlight, you've talked a bit about it, is um, you built the networks. And these networks try, uh, I should say, sustained you when the things are really hard. And one of those very important networks was your wife, yeah? when she was giving you all the fuel. And we shall have a question at the end about that. But the importance of building networks before you make the jump. Um, I want us to talk deeply about that. How was it for you and how much credit do you take back to the fact that you built networks in the 12 years of being in the industry? And again, you could also expound how these networks have really moved AIJ to where it is today. Every business has a face. The face of AIJ is me. And that face has, you know, it, it must have roots and, and stems and everything. Over the last 15 years of my career, I've built on networks. I mean, I do these days trainings. But I call editors that used to be my bosses. You call William Skato to come and train. You call Tabubu Tajira. You call all these big boys in the journalism industry because that's the industry I'm in. So I'm leveraging those networks. The people who I used to you know, interview in the past, right now are the people I go to to ask for business. Networks, they, they say what? Your network is your net worth. Yeah, networks. Networks are very important. Sometimes people who even are not in the journalism world send me links to proposals. Did you see this call? I was in a group and they dropped it. I thought you would actually look at it. Oh, by the way, there was a, a bidding document. Look in tomorrow's, in yesterday's New Vision. You can look at it and read about it because they care about you. Because you've designed a network. And these are the same people who will be on decision boards. We'll say, hmm? You know, someone just gives you job, uh, work because of your job. Right? And whatever, because you, you've been doing excellent work, someone said, but yeah, that guy is thorough. Let's give him the job. I mean, look, you know, so your networks plus the quality of the work that you're doing is important. It's bad to have a network and your people are just talking about bad things. Oh, yo, you give him a project, he delays with it. That guy, you get so how do you actually grow your network? But with excellence. I have, an, I have a CEO who always gives me consultancies at a personal level. So the auditors asked, but why is this guy the only person doing work? And they said, because he's simply the best in the market. Do you have any issues with him doing work? That's why we do selective procurement. And the auditors took it. You know what I mean? So even the guys who are supposed to support you, you have, don't take that for granted. When they give you a consultancy, a friend has called you and said, you know what, Solo, take this consultancy up. You do it like he's not your friend. In fact, the last people I want to disappoint. 
are those friends because they would think that I am taking their friendship for granted. So I usually give my best. I usually give my best to them. So as you create networks over the last 15 years over the life of your career, it's important that you also back it up with excellence because it's those networks that will be there for you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, let's jump into the questions. The first hand uh, here. Thank you so much, Solomon, for the opportunity and gracing us with your presence. I'm very elated. I have a number of questions, but I'll try to limit them so that I allow others to ask. Now, my first question is, when did you break even? Because um, you are new to the field, and we get to know that many entrepreneurs give up along the way, simply because they're not seeing the yields of their effort and the sweat they're putting into these enterprises. So when did you break even? And then also, it's very important to note that you came from a background that was not of business, of entrepreneurship, but you are more of a journalist. So how do you get more equipped in line of being a CEO? Because this was a, a completely new venture. You had your skill, your craft, and something very unique that we haven't seen uh, anywhere in the world or maybe particularly in Uganda. So how do you equip yourself to actually be a CEO of the um, academy, as I may call it right now? And then the other question, I think, would come down to the uniqueness of what you are doing. Because we must say the field you're in is very threatening, okay? Uh, the investigative journalism, we've, we've, you've talked about how the Bureau asked whether you won't be a threat to the nation. How have you maneuvered the threats that come with the kind of work that you are doing? I remain patient, Salaso, an entrepreneur and a mentor, coach. I also am a co-founder of Dominion Creatives. We literally give Ugandan youth who are very creative who can dance and do all that, and we give them a platform to harness their skill and literally earn from it. So we are a creative enterprise. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Those were three, so let me just put them off real quick before I forget. I think the first one is, the first question you asked is, when did I break even? I think it was this year, actually. <laughs> is this year that we, 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 we got a grant from um, we got a grant from the EU in partnership. It was a consortium. Usually, we have leveraged the power of consortiums. You can't go in it alone. You've got to have a team that supports you. Like when we are writing grants these days, I don't write grants for the organization alone, no. I hope on other people so that we can write together. By the way, that's also important as entrepreneurs. So we, we, we've been getting grants but from different donors, but not entirely as us, but we bring our craft to the entire, like people, you know, it's little, 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 you know, someone gets that, the other, but co like on a whole, like the whole consortium can be given $1 million and they give you 250000 I'm happy with that. Like, I know that my rent is covered, all my salaries for project stuff are covered, and then I get another one. You know, someone gives you $100,000 and you only have 25, it's okay. So we've been able to understand that you can't go in it alone and that the power of partnerships is very important. One. The second question you asked is, um, uh, yeah, you, okay, let me first jump on the, the last question where you mentioned the kind of work that I do. Oh, no, I remembered that I was a journalist and not entirely a CEO. I have had to sit at the feet of people who know how the civil society space plays and learn from them on the job. So I would literally say, how do you manage people? How do you, and how do you deal with organizational politics how do you write a grant so how do you like i had to learn on the job because all i knew was storytelling and journalism but i had to learn on the job i got like two people who i would consult all the time i was mentored 
by these people. You know, someone tells you, no, solo, that is not your money. You get excited of getting $250,000 and you see it on the account like, whoop, like, sir, that is not your money. The only money that you're entitled to is the salary, period, kakana. So I had to learn, you know. Remember, you've been going through a desert of no money, 10K, 5K, 2K. Someone gives you $250,000. You're like, <laughs> huh? $250,000 It's close to a billion. But that's not your money. It's not your money. So you just have to know that, that they're they going to be audited. Like that money is going to be audited. You mess around with the audits, that donor will not give you money. So, you know, systems. How do you set up systems that work? Setting up a board, you know. All these things, they mentored me. So it's important that every entrepreneur, you have someone who mentors you, who holds you accountable. You know what I mean? So that's how I was able to, 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 to sort of grow into a CEO. Last question is the nature of the work that we do. Trust me, you cannot do investigative journalism and you don't step on toes. Mm. So you guys have heard that we are training journalists, but then the state sort of tricks it that we are recruiting people for foreign agents, that we are working for foreigners. Yesterday, M7 was talking about we will crush foreign agents. You know that whole agency, agents thing, eh? it's, it's, it sort of threatens me, by the way. Because if the narrative around is that you're a foreign agent, you are, it's just rubbish that you supports uh, like supported by LGBTQ for even sake we don't have any project run on anything on LGBTQ we just do journalism period or investigative journalism and somehow there's a cartel of people online who actually tweak the story and sell it differently I mean we've been doing like trainings across the whole country and then someone is reporting that we are actually recruiting journalists I, into foreign agents. Can you imagine someone walked to me and said that some intelligence reports have it that I work for MI6? <laughs> Can you imagine? And then there's the other guys like, hey boss, but aren't you a member of Mossad? <laughs> My guy. Mossad. <laughs> I work for the Israeli government. Anyway, so there are all those allegations that come up, and they sort of sometimes, there are threats that come to you, there are attacks online, it all comes. But this is the space I'm in. I'll not stop doing investigations because I am fearing or what, or because I'll not train people because they, you know, people think that I'm recruiting people into, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just, crazy but you just keep doing what you do and we are not about to stop because that's my mastery you want me to do accounts or what <laughs> like do you want me to do accounts i can't do accounts because that's not what i know all i know is journalism and investigative journalism so you take it away from me you've taken me away as well so yeah, we keep doing it. It's dangerous, it's risky, but we just keep doing it. Someone has to do it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, over to you, Mr. Mugabe. Oh, you have a mic. Oh, yes. Hello, Solomon. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being kind to share the wisdom that you possess to the crowd here. We really appreciate and don't take that for granted. Some of us, when we heard about this prominent person coming to speak to like Stud Hub were like this is going to be my first chance to step in this area and we thank you so much for what you have shared today we have picked a lot I personally have picked a lot as an upcoming business lady a specialist at what I do I have picked a lot so that being that being put aside how do you uh, because I get your story how do you get you when you jumped yeah you you had to to get mentors but i don't want to say a hundred percent it came as luck because you had built a name you were somebody at that point so i feel like getting in these platforms where you got these mentors helped a bit so how do you advise someone 
who is at this level having no name, they don't have this opportunity. They have not built anything on their own. They are just growing up in everything they are doing. How do you advise them to get in spaces where they are going to get mentors, and these mentors are going to genuinely help them grow at what they have as ideas without stealing these ideas away from them? Because people have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of ideas, but we are scared because who are we speaking to? And are they really going to help us move together, or they are just going to take your idea away from you and you lose out just like that. Yeah. Let me answer that real quick. So this is where perhaps Startup exists, right? Because they're supposed to help startups. It's supposed to link you, link you up with the people in the industry for them to support and mentor you. I think that's the first thing. I think so if you have an idea or if you're in the area, whichever area you're in, I'm, here, I'm, 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 I'm sure Startup will support because that's their niche is to start that bulb, you know, to light. But also, too, you must know the people in, 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 the, field of, of the, in the field that you're in. If you're into the journalism space, who are the big journalists? If you're into the health space, who are the people who have made it in, in the pharmaceutical industry, for example? You want to begin a pharmacy. Who are the people who have made it in the pharmaceutical space? How can you find the CEO of Freeacre? or of these other firms that have made it, how can you learn from them? And sometimes you have to be aggressive, you know? Y you, you're in the journalism space and you want Serwanja to mentor you, face him, say, hi, I'm actually, you know, solo, I want you to mentor me. Because I have a passion, you know, like, yeah, sometimes you have to aggressively go out there and look out for these people. But now the fact that you have the umbrella of startup, they have a big name than you. They just say, hi, Solo, we would love you to meet so-and-so. You know, he, he, it's just crazy ideas, but listen to him. I've had friends who do that, actually, who just go and say, look, we found this brilliant guy. He's crazy about his dreams, but all I ask is I'd give him an ear. Just listen to him. And it starts there. Yeah? So sometimes you may not have a name, you may not have anything, but you can leverage on, you know, what is around us. Yeah. What do you have right now? You have StartHub. We start with that. Say so StartHub, I'm, I'm into, um, I want to start maybe skincare or what. This is my dream. I want to work on, you know, women's skin. I want to do this. My dream is this. And they'll connect you to the right people. Right? Yeah. And then you start to research. Who is the biggest guy in skincare? Who's the biggest entrepreneur in skincare? Then you begin to reach out to them, visit them, have conversations with them, learn from them. It's very important, right? I don't know if I've answered that question. Uh, my name is Asio Brenda. Thanks for sharing. I've learned a lot. Uh, personally, I've never been into employment, straight from university into, that, into entrepreneurship. Yeah, we all uh, co-founded a tech startup. We develop web applications and we build websites. Wow. My two questions are, how, tell us uh, the people that you, uh, the people that you met, the influential people. Uh, one of the key things that I think I struggled with at first, or that I still struggle with, how do you actually get a person to listen to you, the influential people? The second one is, how did you handle challenges or failures that you had into the entrepreneurs entrepreneurship space or yeah or have you failed at some point and you felt like oh I, I couldn't it so many times yeah. so many times you're thinking what did i get myself into uh, all entrepreneurs have that question right what did i get myself into i ask that sometimes and then you remember, or you reminded about the vision. Like, I am here because I know it's not going to be easy, but the, the future of the vision is still alive. Because the moment you don't encourage yourself. Also, you need to be in the space of fellow entrepreneurs. They share. You know, there's, 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 I was in a space of... The Aga Khan organized a space for... Um, for fellow entrepreneurs within East Africa, and I was one of them. And the last session was interesting because they said, everyone write an encouraging word and share. 
like write a word like a line or two and then put it in a box and then everyone kept picking right and the one that i kept i put it on my wall and it was be kind to yourself like i it's just there be kind to yourself don't beat yourself too hard like every time i'm like oh my god i look at it and like be kind to yourself don't beat yourself too hard like you always have to be a, in a space of fellow people like such spaces you get encouraged you share how do you manage this how have you managed resource mobilization how have you managed marketing people will give you ideas and don't die alone like this by the way this entrepreneurship journey people can die alone you don't know how many businesses, business ideas die. So many businesses. You're going to ask them. I, I was told it was one of the innovative entrepreneurship space. But so many businesses or innovations never make it past their first birthdays. Why? And I think this is the question that Startup is answering. Sometimes you just be there alone and you don't even know who to talk to. You know what I mean? Like, you don't even have anyone to share your dream with or your challenges with. So when you come to such spaces like this, it's, it's great. So there's so many times that I had wanted to give up. But I'm reminded that, you know, I have to keep this dream alive. But also hearing from other people's stories. If any of you shared your stories here, I, I don't think it's so different from mine. Many of you have, like, but you see, all businesses started from somewhere. The mighty big companies that you see, the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the, you know, Tech, ChatGPT, all these guys who are big, started somewhere, but they have a story behind them. So you can't give up, right? But it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's just from being in spaces like these where you can pour out. You know, in that session that we had with entrepreneurs, we had a session where people were just crying. And someone just cries and says, why did I get myself into this? Like, sometimes it's so heavy to carry. And you feel overwhelmed. And just some, you just want someone to speak into your life. Some positivity. Like, pick your rugs up, boss. We have a vision to chase. It doesn't, it's not easy. Right? The other question is, how do you get to these big people? Again, start hub. Talk. How do you get them to? You see, some of these big people sometimes are proud. Eh? You call them like, who is this? Okay, let me talk to my uh, secretary and see if we can get you a schedule. But sometimes you can leverage on the big names. You see, I'll give you an example. There's a journalist, Hakim Wampamba. He really wanted to be like he wanted to, 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 to be a journalist. So he took his CV to NBS, Vichy, Navy Ghana. So this guy comes to me at the institute. He says, Solo, I've admired you. I want to be like you. I want to work for NBS. I picked up a call. I called Kin Carissa. I said, I just need you to do one thing for me, Kin. Listen to this boy. Said, no, Solo, you should come to office tomorrow. Uh, Lillian, get, you make sure this boy comes to see me. The rest is history. Hakim Wampamba is now a reporter on TV. Sometimes it's as easy as that. There are doors that you can't open for yourself. But there are doors that are easily opened by someone else. So sometimes you need to know, how do I open that door? A simple call. I mean, the guy had put CVs, he has done what, you know. But a simple call. Hiking, it's solo. Ah, solo, how are you, my man? Fine. Hakim Wampamba is a, is a very brilliant boy. I need you to listen to him. He has a first class. He's good. Listen, I'm just giving him your ear. So sometimes it gets to that. And that's what startup, I mean, if startup... Startup calls anyone in this country. Anyone. They will come. 
or just organize a date with you and your, 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 your idol or your someone who you want or your mentor. Hey, Solo, can we do lunch tomorrow? We'd love you to meet someone. Oh, thanks. Okay. Let's meet at Serena. In that ample time, that space, you can pour out your heart. And you don't know where that can lead. Right? So sometimes, it's, by, by the way, those big boys can feel sweet sometimes. Like a little no one, like, mwana. Guy na mukubide mwana. Na malamu na amani. Those moments are there. But how best can you get to them and get their attention to listen to you? But all of us who have been entrepreneurs know that we have been there. And that's the thing that keeps reminding me. Every time I get a call from people and they want to meet me, I say, you come. Because I've been in that space where I want someone to listen to me. I tell them, come. Come to my office tomorrow. I mean, Derek just called me and told me, Solo, would love to host you. Of course, I had busy schedules and all that. I said, Derek, I'm busy now, but I'll come. And I'm here. Because I know all of us have, all of us who are entrepreneurs go through that once in our lifetime. And you don't want someone to shut their door on you. And God forbid you shut your door on others. Because you've walked that journey before. Right? So even when God lifts you up, and someone wants to see you, and tomorrow you're the next billionaire. You've made it to Forbes' list. Say, come, let's talk. Sometimes that's all people want to. Just talk to you. Can you imagine? They don't even want money. They just want to talk to you. Right? Imagine if you got an opportunity to talk with CK. Of Innovation Village. You know, just to talk with him. Just sit and talk with CK. He just tells you about startups. Because he's the master at that. You know, he supports businesses and young entrepreneurs to grow. And that's all. By the way, I'm looking forward to a person telling me, I am giving you a job to just talk to people. I'll pay you a salary. And I'll be the happiest. Just to talk to people and inspire them, I'll be the happiest. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll give this lady the mic from me. The last one. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, I don't know if you can see me or should I stand up? Anything can as well stand up. That makes you comfortable, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, my name is Makile Toma, and uh, I'm a third year student of journalism at UCU. So, um, you spoke about niche. And it's something that many of us struggle with. You have always had the passion for investigative journalism. Some of us um, have this thing whereby give us a mic, we can speak. Give us a paper, we can write. Give me a camera, I will shoot. Now, then you take it down to passion. Now, how then do you know that, yeah, this is it. This, this is it. Because many of the people I've tried to reach out to, they'll be like, just try out everything. Try out everything. You'll know the one. Trust me. I'm graduating and I still haven't found the one. So... How do I get there? Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Trying to find ourselves. At that initial phase, it's difficult to find yourself. But, I mean, I remember myself even when I was still doing, you know, undergrad. Um, the, the biggest question then that comes is whether, whether you can find yourself while still in journalism school, sometimes there's something that you're passionate about. You say, maybe I love cameras. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to be the best female camera lady. Oh, I love writing. Oh, I love poetry. This is something that, something that you love. But sometimes the dream c becomes more clear as you grow into it. Right? Maybe right now it's still abstract. But as you get into the job market, you, you, you know, you begin to, you begin to, you know, sh yeah, you begin to crystallize it. How many of you maybe knew about what you wanted to do at uni? You see? Third year, maybe there are few. But second year, third year, you're still finding your, your place. 
of course, sometimes you want to say, I want to be on radio, I want to be on TV, I want to, you know, it's all over. They put you before a console on, on a microphone radio, you want to be there. You put you on TV, they tell you to write, they tell you to design, they tell you to be a cameraman, you're everywhere, everywhere, yeah. But as you get into the newsroom, then you begin to say, okay, I love reporting on climate change, or I love reporting on justice, or I love reporting on fashion and design. You know, you sort of like begin to crystallize your your passion as you grow into the industry. Do that make sense? So it may not be clear now, but it will crystallize. I mean, I didn't leave journalism school at undergrad knowing that I'm passionate about investigative journalism, no? No, 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 no. So it's okay, sweetie. Take yourself low, slow. It will, you know, as you get into the market, it begins to crystallize. It begins to be more clear, and the passion grows with time. All right? Yeah. My love, you have the final say. Thank you so much. My name is Alinda Ingrid. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm a baker and an engineer by profession. Well, uh, my question is actually related to hers. It was in line with purpose. Like, how do you reconcile what you do with purpose? Like, how do you, since you have a business, how, how did you reconcile it with purpose? Because there is, there is a point people reach and they feel so frustrated. They have the skill, they have everything, but they're still not yet there. And you talked about the aspect of mastering your time. How do you master your time for a starter? Thank you. All right, thanks. <coughs> eh, an engineer who is a baker. <laughs> Interesting. That's a great one. Some of us, I think I can answer your, s your question with passion. I have a rich friend who wanted their daughter to be engineer, an engineer. But the girl wanted to be a designer. So the girl was brilliant. She went and did civil engineering. After that, she took the degree to the dad. He is civil engineering. Right now, the girl, Atunga Chalan. Chalani. As in, you find out. She's now designing for people. She's. But that's her passion. And she started, she has now started to grow into it. She's starting a label. She's now starting to design. She's getting big celebrities to design for. You know, she wants to grow bigger, bigger, bigger. Her dream is completely different because that's where her passion is. Are we together? So we have another engineer here who is a baker. And your question is, how do you find purpose? What is it that you're passionate about? Because if it's baking, then you're going to diversify into baking. It's difficult to master two things. Today you're in the, in the kitchen baking, tomorrow you're on the roads doing construction. It's crazy. So it's either going to be, I am going to take this line to actually grow my career in civil engineering or electrical engineering and maybe grow my business there. Or I am going to follow my passion and I go into baking. I don't care what the world says. Then I learn how to do tiers of you know, cake cream, what, how do you design better, how do you build a big bakery, how do you grow into it, the next day we hear you've opened up a bakery name and you're, you know, you're growing bigger than life. But at the tail end of it is passion. Because you can get all the money you want, all the money, and you're not happy. I have had people resigning from jobs that are paying them very well. And they just go and do things that they're passionate about. Can you imagine someone leaves a 20 million, dollar, 20 million shillings job 
and then just goes and does something like you no know, you know what when you grow up eh, it's not about the money eh? when like some people will tell you you know you cannot understand it until when you get to where i am like sometimes it's about the money i want to do this because i'm passionate about it right. so how do you find your purpose look deep within your heart in there lies that answer right I hope that answers you. Thank you very much, guys, for listening to me. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Solomon.